Public Forum, a community outreach program produced by North Idaho College located on Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. We're most pleased to bring you a two-part series on a very, very important topic. One of the greatest women in history was Mary Wollstonecraft from Europe. In fact, I would contend that she's the most substantive and voluminous writer on women's issues, and she's unfortunately partially been lost in history. And we have a guest today that's bringing her back to life and has been doing so for some years. We welcome to the program Dr. Virginia Tinsley Johnson. Our guest is chair of the North Idaho College Communications, Fine Arts, and Humanities Division. She holds a doctor's degree uh, from Idaho State University, and in 1987, I'm so proud to say, she was chosen as the Teacher of the Year across the United States for community college uh, educators. Uh, again, congratulations for that, and Virginia, welcome to our program. It's, I've admired you for years, and thank you for what you're doing with the Chautauqua performances of Mary Wollstonecraft. Thank you, Tony. And as always, I'm very pleased to have uh, our regular panelist, Janelle Burke, who's an attorney state of Idaho. And to start out this first of a two-part series, uh, Janelle Burke will ask the first questions to Dr. Johnson. I join Tony in saying welcome to the show, and it's a pleasure to have you here again. We want to talk about Mary Wollstonecraft, and she's not exactly a household name, <laughs> so can you tell our viewers a little bit about her, please? Okay, I'd be glad to. Uh, I usually begin when I meet people who ask who is Mary Wollstonecraft by saying she's Frankenstein's grandmother. And most people know who Frankenstein is, and they, some of them even know that the story of Frankenstein was written by a woman who was not Mary Wollstonecraft, but her daughter, Mary Shelley. And so I work backwards then from Frankenstein to Mary Shelley, and I say that Mary Wollstonecraft died giving birth to Mary Shelley, which she did, but that she was an incredible writer and thinker in her own right. Uh, she was an 18th century figure and was an English woman, was born and raised in England and had, as I now have, an itchy foot to travel. So she loved traveling and she sought independence all of her life. Uh, she was born to a middle class family, the first daughter and uh, the second oldest child and was mostly self-educated, but early on began realizing that she had a kind of genius for understanding thought and questioning her rights as a woman and wanting to get away from her father who was an alcoholic and who beat her mother so she even came from a dysfunctional family had that modern I guess not so great honor but uh, began by taking on the jobs that a woman could have as being a governess, a ladies companion, a teacher and then determined to become a writer and she wrote some books about caring for children but she became really interested in the revolution, the French Revolution, and wrote a response to Edmund Burke about his feelings about the French Revolution called The Vindication of the Rights of Man, and then decided to turn the issue of the rights of man to the rights of woman, and that's when she wrote her Vindication of the Rights of Woman. She also wrote a, a history of the French Revolution, only got one chapter of that finished, wrote two novels, which I will admit are not very good, she was hired by a publisher in England, in London, who had her translating. She had taught herself French and German, so she translated and was a reviewer of other people's books. And then finally, uh, near the end of her life, she traveled in Scandinavia and wrote a book of letters from Scandinavia, which I think are her best books. But she's probably best known as the grandmother of women's liberation, as I've heard her called and read about her. Uh, our viewers don't know, we're about to inform them that <coughs> After playing uh, this role, and we've been doing for seven years at North Carolina College the Chautauqua format where historical characters are brought back to life, and not only have you performed here in a very eloquent way, but you've done this before a national conference in Chicago. You yeah. did a tour in Nevada, and understand also at the University of Idaho at the English department. Uh, <clears throat> so I commend you for doing this, but I was so impressed that you decided to take on a trip to Europe to, to just absorb yourself in, in, in more of her works and life by doing a journey uh, following the same routes that, uh, that she traveled in Europe. And you've been so kind as to bring a, a, a small sample of all the great photographs you have on that trip. So on show number one today, I want you to take us through uh, the first part of your trip. Okay. And, and the, they're going to put up some slides, and this, there's 12 of them in this first show. And 
And if you'll tell us where this is at and right. how it relates to Mary Wollstonecraft. Okay, I'll be glad to. <clears throat> Uh, the first slide is a picture that I took in Paris. Now, I went to Paris to begin with on my journey and her footsteps, although that isn't where she went first. I had to go where the plane flights went most inexpensively and uh, travel from there. I also have a nephew who lives in Paris, so that worked out well. This is uh, number 22 Rue Melet in Paris, and this is the place where Mary Wollstonecraft lived when she went there in 1792, by herself, by the way, to see the French Revolution at first hand. Interesting to me was that you can see in the lower right a woman's dress, and this was a street that was lined with women's shops, mostly shoe stores. And Mary Wollstonecraft would have been appalled because she just hated commerce and getting and spending. So uh, it was irony many of the times I was in the city. The second f uh, photograph. The second is a photo of the uh, area of Avenue de Nuit. And Nuit is a very romantic spot in the history of Mary Wollstonecraft. It's now built up, but at the time she was there, in the 1790s, it would have been mostly farm country, and Paris was a walled city. And so what we have here is the area where she lived and that she met and had her assignations with her American lover, Gilbert Imlay, who was uh, a veteran of the American Revolution and by whom she had her daughter, Fanny. In our third slide. The third is some people may recognize is the famous Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. This was just a real thrill to be at Versailles, um, which is a day trip out from Paris. I went there because I knew that Mary Wollstonecraft had visited there and in fact had been really appalled at the expensive fixtures and as you see the reflections as she said of people who saw themselves in all their glory in these mirrors and it is a place of extreme excess and of course Mary, Revolu uh, sorry, Mary was on the side of the revolutionaries during the revolution and went to see what it was all about. Um, I think we've skipped a slide there but we'll go on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was another one of Versailles. Um, this one is a, a slide of Lisbon and up on the hill where the flags are you see the castle of St. George and this is a really typical scene Lisbon is uphill every direction, I swear. Mary Wollstonecraft went to Lisbon because her best friend was married to an, an English businessman who lived in Lisbon, and she was uh, going to have a baby. Mary determined that she was going to join her, borrowed money, sailed by herself to Lisbon, attended to her friend, who unfortunately died in childbirth. But she uh, did walk around the hills of Lisbon. I don't know exactly where she was but she, I'm certain, would have probably visited this, this castle. Area. Mm -hmm. In our next slide. The next slide is a picture, I think this is a statue of St. George himself, which is at the castle St. George. Uh, St. George, by the way, is the patron saint of England, but uh, he is well known throughout Europe, and this is him in full battle gear with sword, etc. In our next slide. The next slide <coughs> is uh, in Ireland. We've I went from uh, Lisbon back to uh, France and then over to Ireland, and this is at a site in Mitchellstown in County Cork, Ireland, where Mary Wollstonecraft was a governess for a very wealthy English family. And this is the graveyard of the castle, and so these tombs, which are all askew in the foreground there, would have been people who would have been the ancestors of the people she lived at. By the way, just so you know, when I went out to take these pictures, I had to step in a big basin of disinfectant because there was a great fear of the right. mad cow disease while I was there in there. Ireland. Mm -hmm. One of your challenges on your trip. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and the next slide. The next slide is also Mitchellstown. <clears throat> this is looking toward the site where the castle was that Mary Wollstonecraft served. But you see that's not a castle. It's a really huge milk processing plant. And the castle that she served in, I discovered when I got there, was no longer there. And in fact, the son of the family for whom she was the governess had torn down that castle and put up in its place the largest castle in Europe. And in 1921, the IRA burned that. From Ireland, I went to Wales. This is Larne, Wales. And this is a place where Mary Wollstonecraft's father lived until he died. And this is the estuary of the River Tav, where Again, Mary Wollstonecraft would have traveled, and perhaps the farm might have been on that hill. I'm not positive about mm -hmm. that. But this and then is, the next one? The next one is also in Larne. This is a path 
that leads to the church where Mary Wollstonecraft worshipped and where I think her father is buried. I could not locate the tomb. But as a side note, this is also the cemetery where the uh, English poet, I should say, excuse me, Welsh poet uh, Dylan Thomas is buried. So it was fun to be in that church and know that she had worshipped there. Sure. And then we'll <coughs> move to the next one. This is in Bath, England, and this is actually where Mary Wollstonecraft had her first job. She was a lady's companion to a nasty old lady named Mrs. Dawson, whom she managed to tame down, as Mrs. Dawson admired, admitted. And this again is a street, um, this is uh, Milson Street, and again, expensive shops, just the most exquisite uh, material there. And th I'm not sure in which house she lived or even if that's there any longer. I asked along the street and no one knew anything about her. But uh, the next slide is, um, again, Milson Street. This is what they call the top of the street. I learned tops and bottoms of streets. Mm -hmm. And it does identify Milson Street and could very well be where she lived at, in that particular house. It's the right architectural style and, and certainly the right time, the right age, so she could have been living in a place very much like that when she was the lady's companion. It is so helpful <coughs> that you brought along the photographs and on our next program we'll have some others, but uh, in the different countries you went throughout Europe, she had traveled in those at different times and at a very difficult time too, like the French Revolution. And, yes, indeed. And is that one of the reasons why you felt it was really, you traveled alone on this trip too, which I think was very courageous of you, but of course times are different from century mm -hmm. to century, but did that not give you also another identification with her to realize that she had long journeys and you had uh, traced those too. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, one of my reasons for going alone was that I decided if Mary Wollstonecraft could go to a revolution alone in 1792, I should be able to travel in Europe by myself in 2001. And I did take my older son with me for a week to Paris and my younger son came and joined me for a week in Sweden, but the rest of the time I did travel alone. I made all my own travel arrangements. I had nobody to blame when I got in trouble. And As only she myself did not, to get me out, <laughs> right? She was in the same situation. She did. But you know, I found, and of course I just keep reading about her, that she and I shared so many really reactions to some of the things. And that was the kindness of strangers and how many times she was, quote, bailed out, to use my term, by people whom she didn't know. And that happened to me several times as well. Janelle Bird. You were on what we could perhaps call a theme trip, yes. a theme travel, and uh, there are other people who do theme travel. Would you recommend it, and, and what would you suggest as to why people would want to travel that way? Well, Janelle, I've been telling everybody who will listen to me that's the only way to go. <laughs> I encountered several people on my journey who were on theme trips. There were people who'd gone to see all the zoological gardens, or people who might be on trips to f go to cooking schools or they wanted to see a certain potters or certain paintings and you could go travel through Europe and see all the race car drivers or almost anything. Uh, the reason I would recommend it is that because I was going in Mary Wollstonecraft's footsteps I saw places I would never have chosen to go otherwise. I went to the in places, I went to the Louvre, I went to uh, the Tower of London and so on, but I would never have gone to Mitchellstown, Ireland, by the way, or Larne, Wales, or maybe even Lisbon, and certainly not to the small villages I went to in Norway because I would not have known about them. And it thrills me when I even watch television now and they show, as they did when I got back home, Gothenburg, Sweden, and I went, I've been there, I know what that looks like. And I know how she saw it because I had an account from her eyes. And my own sons have commented on this, that when my son sees something about Paris, he's been there and the other son was in Stockholm and saying, oh mom, remember when we saw that? That it gives you connections, not only to the places, but I think more importantly to the people who are there, that you meet people you wouldn't otherwise meet. Would you please share that with us? Uh, uh, some of your stories perhaps about meeting oh, people who are okay. particularly interested in Mary. Well, um, one of my favorite stories is about being in Bournemouth, England on Easter Sunday and meeting the Wallaces and they met me as they were walking along uh, taking a little stroll and I had gone on a bus tour and I found that I was out near what I knew was there and that was Wallstonecraft Road and I had my camera which by the way I dropped in my excitement getting off the bus fortunately it worked 
And this elderly man and his wife came along and I asked if they would please take my picture posing by the sign for Wollstonecraft Road and they said, of course. And they asked me a little bit about her and I gave the grandmother of Frankenstein talk and then I did uh, notice that, that they knew a little bit about Mary Wollstonecraft because they knew about Percy Shelley who was her son-in-law or would have been. And they took me over to see the little museum there and then they lived on Byron Road who, and again, Byron's another famous English poet, and they invited me in to have a drink. And then we started talking, and Mr. Wallace showed me his garden and all of his plants. By the way, he'd given me a little botanical lecture all the way back to his home. He was really interested in plants. And then it was nothing but that I had to stay for dinner. And so then I had dinner with him. And then they'd heard there were some black swans down at Poole, and didn't we want to drive down to Poole? And I was just, I was having a fantastic time. They were so generous to take me in. And we didn't find the black swans, by the way, but had a great day and afternoon uh, and one of the most memorable Easter Sundays of my life. I mean, really in the spirit of Easter, I thought, too. That, that, you have such a wonderful way of bringing all that to life to share with us. Uh, as you, and on t next week we're going to go to other places in, <clears throat> in Europe and travel the path of Mary Wollstonecraft, but for the program we've done today and the mm -hmm. places you've traveled, um, as you visited... Um, some of the, the very rich environment, uh, speaking from a financial viewpoint, and then some of the poor areas. Did it bring to life even more uh, the philosophy of Mary Wollstonecraft? You've already mentioned on the program that she, and as part of the French Revolution, she really had a, a real trouble, I guess, with the aristocracy. She certainly did. Um, I would say being at Versailles was a major eye-opener. And I read constantly and, of course, have researched a lot about Mary Wollstonecraft and I'm trying to learn a, a little bit more about the French Revolution and the excesses. But not only is a picture worth a thousand words, but being there is worth a million words to say, I understand what she was talking about. To see the millions of francs that would have been spent on this garden that Louis built for her so she could pretend she was a shepherdess. And it was a whole farm. And then just the incredible gold and paintings and tapestries and furniture and uh, crystal. I just, I'm sure my mouth was just catching flies. Uh, and to know that there were people at the time when all that excess was going off and that one of the causes, of course, for the French Revolution is the economic problems in France. And that they were just, the aristocracy was just, couldn't, they could almost burn money to build this you know, acres and acres of land that needed to be taken care of and fountains and villages and ca little castles and big castles and all the plants and all the people there. It was just phenomenal. And to know that she always felt that wealth should not be inherited, that people should earn their whatever that they had and that there should not be this, this rule of primogeniture for one thing. But she also saw a contrast between, she is an eyewitness to some of the wealth and yet saw the poverty among the absolutely, people. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and identified very strongly with them and wrote about them in her letters. She was a, just a voluminous letter writer and always identifying and, and wishing for more for people who were in poverty and indeed for people in the middle class who she thought, and particularly for women, but men as well, who did not receive adequate educations. And I will say the one thing that she found was the key to solving most of the problems was education. And that's another chord we share, is that we're both teachers. <laughs> and um, in fact, her uh, husband, William Godwin, said she was a born teacher, that she just was always meant to be that. And so she saw that as the key for women and men of lower and middle classes to attain whatever might make their dreams come true. One other question before I go back to Janelle, and I have never thought to ask you this, and we've had a lot of conversations, and I've saw your performances, and you're really masterful at doing this, and I really thank you for bringing her back to life in this way. You've talked a lot about her concept of the French Revolution and, and why she supported the revolution, but having the English background that she had and all, how did she view our revolution, the American Revolution, and, and our desire also to break our colonial ties with uh, the English? You know, Tony, that's an interesting question because I've looked for her responses to that, and in, I've read everything she's written, and I have not found a whole lot of commentary about the Engli or, excuse me, the American Revolution, although I know that she was sympathetic with it, and to the extent that she planned to move to America. And in fact, her brother did come to America. So she saw 
America as a place where some of the values that she really held dear were being lived out. But I think part of her wanderlust also would have led her to America had she lived long enough. Mm -hmm. Janelle Burke. You traveled around Europe, um, and Tony asked you a little bit about your travels earlier, mm -hmm. um, but you traveled alone. Mary Wollstonecraft yes. often traveled alone as well. But there were certain differences. So can you make some comparisons about the way you traveled and the way she traveled? <laughs> I'm sure that something called time has a lot to do oh, with, absolutely. with the differences. But, but can you make some comparisons? Because I know you've studied in depth how she traveled. Yes. Well, I have to tell you, the f this is funny when f on me, not for me. But I reread again uh, this last week her account that was written by William Godwin about her traveling and that by the way, when she traveled to Scandinavia, she had a year-old baby with her and a nursemaid, and I drew the line at that. My 24-year-old <laughs> baby joined me there. But, but what he pointed out is that Mary Wollstonecraft never got seasick. And so she sailed, of course, from England to Lisbon and back. And by the way, saved some Frenchmen on a boat that was floundering on the way, talked the captain into saving them, or she would have him called on record if he didn't. Strong character. I didn't have the guts to do that because mine were being very upset by being seasick myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I went on purpose by ferry because I wanted to have a sailing experience and I'd been on the ferries of Canada. I could handle this. And you also been a sailboat. Oh yes, person. I've, I've sailed, sailed a lot. lot so I wasn't afraid of the water and I was on a huge ferry. It was nine decks and a car ferry and a block long and I got on in, in France at Cherbourg and I um, met some very, a, a man and his son who were from Dublin and so we were chatting and they had said they'd had a really bad crossing. They'd come over the night before. In fact, they'd come to buy wine for the son's wedding because it was cheaper in France. So they loaded their car up with this down in the hold and they were, the son had been very seasick so they were, he was eating crackers and, and uh, I thought, well, that's fine. And then I went to bed about 10 o'clock and the boat started sort of rolling back up and down and up and down. And I thought, well, I'm just in my mother's womb. This is fine. I'm going to be okay. <laughs> and then it not only was going up and down, then it started going back and forth. And then I got up and I'm pretty claustrophobic. And I thought, I have to get out of here. So I got dressed and was going to go out and try to get some fresh air. And I had this really strange sensation up around my ears and it wasn't a hearing problem. And <laughs> as I've been saying, I know why the super flush toilets on those ferries because I was very, very seasick. And I was on there with about three large groups of French students who were going to Ireland on a field trip, and they were all seasick, and they had all come out into the uh, on the uh, <laughs> lobby and were had their sheets and were very white, and there were little, not little, large stacks of white bags sitting all over the place, and I was sick for the whole pass, the whole crossing, and it's a very rough place. It's where the English Channel, the Irish Sea, and the Atlantic meet, and there was a big storm, and so even the crew was getting pretty seasick. And I thought, Mary Wollstonecraft was on a sailboat. It took her three weeks to go from uh, England down to Lisbon. And she didn't get seasick. And she also went by stagecoach, didn't she? Yes, she did. Uh, she too, did. As well. In fact, she went back and forth from France to Le Havre on the coast there by coach. And at least one trip, three times, the coach turned over and pitched the people out. And it was, it was really dangerous travel. So she went, um, she talked about at one point she was sailing and it was only a three hour wait. And I said, how long would we wait for three hours? We gripe about going to the airport for an extra hour now. If it was only three hours, you know, that that was really nothing. And she just let herself get hungry while that time was going on. But then she didn't get seasick. In, in her works and writings, you, you've really gone through those with a fine tooth comb. Did she ever talk about her physical strength and, and she, why she was able to, to be so strong? You know, it's interesting that she was not altogether a well woman. Now, I think she may have had some severe depression. You know, maybe she could have taken medication had she had it. But she writes frequently about her nerves and about uh, headaches and so on. But I think she overcame it. And that just the force of her character that she wouldn't allow herself to be ill. And she was a real believer in walking and healthy diet. And what she observed in Scandinavia particularly was how badly the children were fed and their clothing. And her own daughter, she would wrap in very loose clothes and 
believed in breastfeeding and, as I said, wrote books about childcare and had one planned for raising children. And so she herself was very careful about her diet. She was an absolute teetotaler. Of course, her father had been a drinker. And so she was sort of an early, quote, health nut. But that was... Interesting. Um, that helped her in her journey. I'm well. sure it did. And that she wasn't too finicky an eater. I can't imagine that she was. Uh, you said she died in childbirth. Yes, so she, she had more than one child. She did. She had her illegitimate daughter with Gilbert Imlay, and then she had uh, the woman who became Mary Shelley with William Godwin, her husband. And so, but the, uh, the, the first child was born some years before uh, Shelley when, she, when Mary Wollstonecraft yes, died. Yes, uh, I think she was three years. She's only three years old. Yeah. So she didn't live to, to raise her either, did no. she? No, no, mm -hmm. and that was a tragic ending for her. That girl committed suicide when she was about 20. Yeah, so, so there, were, there were lots of parts of Mary Wollstonecraft life that were very uh, difficult for her. Very difficult, very uh, sad. We have a little time left, but she had some problems at home too growing up, didn't she? Yes. Not only was her father an alcoholic, her brother, who received the family fortune, got to go off and be a lawyer, and so her education was pretty much on her shoulders. Her mother died when she was about 19, so then she became almost the mother to her sisters and her brother, and always had a job and sent money home. She kept her father alive because he was a wastrel. He wanted to be a gentleman farmer, wasted all the money. And she was always finding jobs for her sisters and trying to get positions for her brothers. So she had an unhappy home life, an unhappy love life. The irony is finally when she met someone she loved and she was looking forward to the future, she died. She dies when she found, yes. when she found that. That's right. That bliss. Yeah. So she really became uh, the mother and the father of her family. Uh, because of her mother dying yes. and, and her father being, I guess one could call it irresponsible person. Yes. So there's a lot of tragedy in her life, but yet she moved beyond that to deal with that very important issue of women's issues. And That's women's right. Work. Yeah, so she, that, just, she had that strength. vision that she really had a yeah. strong vision that she just stayed with. She was she was stubborn. Yeah, I'd say. On that note, I have to bring our program to conclusion. Dr. Johnson, on behalf of Janelle Burke and our staff, it's really been a delight today. And, Thank you. And you're so articulate and so exciting that you've gone and and learn so much about her, not only dealing with all of her works, but actually being there. Mm -hmm. The good news with our viewers is that you will be back with us again next week, and we'll do part two of the life of Mary Wollstonecraft, as told by Dr. Virginia Tinsley Johnson, both in her uh, readings of her works, but also traveling to Europe. And uh, one of the things we'll talk about next week is dealing with uh, some other aspects of the travel that we didn't get in this week. I know you've enjoyed the program as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. And I would like to invite you to be with us again next week uh, at this very same time when we will, as I've indicated, have Dr. Virginia Tinsley Johnson back to do part two of the life of Mary Wollstonecraft. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running entirely college produced program on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us again at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. Public Forum, a community outreach program produced by North Idaho College located on Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart in welcoming today's guests. We're most pleased to bring you part two of our two-part series uh, addressing the life of Mary Wollstonecraft. Miss Wollstonecraft uh, lived in Europe and uh, I do believe that she could be listed as the probably most substantive writer, certainly of her time, dealing with women's rights. Uh, just a, a, a marvelous uh, understanding of uh, the issue of equality. She's been unfortunately forgotten in history by many people, and we're very pleased that someone at North Idaho College has brought uh, this correction about. I welcome to the program Dr. Virginia Tinsley Johnson. Dr. Johnson, cheers. 
the Communications, Fine Arts, and Humanities Division at North Idaho College. She holds a doctor's degree uh, in the field of English from Idaho State University. And in 1987, she was chosen nationwide as the Teacher of the Year for our community colleges in America. I'm pleased to announce also that recently she was appointed as a member of the Idaho Humanities Council. Uh, thank you for taking on that responsibility and task too, Dr. Johnson. Thank you. And welcome to our program. Uh, and retracing Mary Wollstonecraft's uh, journey through Europe. Uh, last week we got part of the way through it. This week we will finish that journey and have more wonderful photographs from Dr. Johnson. And as always, I welcome our regular panelist, Janelle Burke, who will start today's questioning. Mary Wollstonecraft was very courageous in her life. Um, and you've talked about her last week and some of her courageous deeds. But she was courageous in her life. She was courageous in her writing. She was courageous in her travels. Can you share with our viewers some of the examples of courage that were evident from Mary Wollstonecraft's life? I would be glad to. Um, she's a model of courage to me. I feel as though she just is most remarkable that she would take on all the things that she did. I'd say an example of her courage in life would have been when she was a young girl and that her father was abusive to her mother and that she would try to intervene when he had these drunken rages at her and even would lie on the door frame in front of their bedroom to intervene in case her father should begin beating up on her mother. So that she was brave in that family life. Also that she took on really pretty much caring for her own sisters and brothers when her mother died and her father had lost the family fortune and was unable to uh, get their oldest brother, Ned, who was a quite wealthy lawyer, to even share a bit of the fortune that had come to him. And so she courageously took jobs on, traveled, and took on jobs that weren't really very pleasant in order to be independent, but also to provide for her family. So that in her life, she was courageous, as you said. I'd say in her career, she was courageous because she chose to take on writing as a profession. She called herself a member of a new genus, the woman who would make a living by writing. Now, she wasn't quite accurate because there were some other women who were making a living by writing, but not nearly with as many genres as she chose because she wrote fiction and a great deal of nonfiction, uh, book reviews, uh, reviews of operas even when she had to teach herself how to, to know all those things, to know the languages and to read philosophy and literature and so forth. Um, an interesting footnote comes to mind here that she loved quoting from famous authors, among them Shakespeare, but she's always off by about a word every time. Um, she didn't have her source book, so she would have whatever the meat of the quotation was. So that's, that humanized her a lot to me. I thought, well, when I'm performing Mary Wollstonecraft, if I miss a word or two, she'll understand. But that a courage to go ahead and set her own career that was really counter to every, what everyone else was doing and to take part in a circle of intellectual men in London that she was the only woman member of, um, that she just held her own with these men. And then in her travels, as you said, uh, to travel to the French Revolution where she was in grave danger for her life in 1792 and take up a dwelling with people she didn't know um, she did at one point go to uh, the site in Paris where there had been a guillotine, there was blood on the street, and she just suddenly became very real to her, that this wasn't just abstract idealism, that it was real people. And she apparently said something and people warned her that she should be quiet or she could end up in prison. Um, her lover, Gilbert Emily, who was an American, registered her as his wife when um, England or France declared war on England because she could have been imprisoned as many of her friends were. So she, and she had the courage to stay by her friends, uh, among them Thomas Paine, by the way, whom she knew pretty well. And then to take off on a trip for, to Scandinavia as her lover's business representative to find out about some investments he'd made on her own, just, I was just astonished. And to not know where her next lodging was going to be, where her next meal would come from, where her next carriage ride might be, she just was, didn't seem to bother her. She, just wrote about it as if it were an everyday event. On that note, we're going to go now to uh, some of your great photographs uh, on the second part of your journey. And uh, they'll put up the first slide. And if you'll just take us through uh, these as you did on other slides okay. last week. Well, the first slide is one of my favorite places. And this is in Bournemouth, England, which is on the coast. Uh, this was on Easter 
Sunday or Monday that I took this photo and it's looking down at St. Peter's Church in Bournemouth and I'm standing by her gravesite and looking down at this church where these wonderful women were selling tea and coffee and cold drinks in the church and uh, pointed me out in the direction of where the tomb was and they gave me a little pamphlet that described that it was out there. That will move us to the next slide and the next one is the site itself. With, that is the, the, where yes, her grave is. Yes, that's where her grave is with, as you see, the flowers blooming. It was very green there. And I'm sort of in the reverse position now looking up. I have to tell you, if you notice the yellow daffodils, that one of the joys of my trip is I had two months of daffodils because yeah. I kept moving north. And I had a yellow but very wet spring. But I had lots of daffodils. And the, and the thing that happened at this site at this time, which I'd almost forgotten, is... The, a rainbow came out oh. and was over this grave when oh, I got there. there. And uh, the sun often came out when I went to places that were important. I started becoming superstitious <laughs> about this, but when the rainbow came, I was almost moved to tears. That was a really <laughs> special moment. The next slide is also of, of Yes, Earth. this is this is looking down, and what it says on the top, although you can't see that, is that this is also the tomb site where her husband, William Godwin, her daughter, Mary Shelley, Shelley Percy Bysshe Shelley's heart, which I can tell you a story about if we have time, why only his heart is there. And the Shelley's son and his wife, are, as well as Mary Wollstonecraft, are all buried in this tomb. So that's the gravesite for the family. And I believe we have one more photograph of the tomb. Yes. That will come up yeah, next. And this is looking uh, from the downhill side up at the tomb. And that pink blob you see there is actually a bouquet of flowers that someone brought to Mary Wollstonecraft's grave. She's buried, her name, uh, is on that side of the tomb and so someone had brought that. By the way, I tried to do a rubbing of that grave. That was one of the most hilarious sites of my trip when I had not the right tools and I was covered with black chalk and uh, had three pieces of paper trying to get this long name put on. I rolled that up and carried it with me and finally threw it away. It was not a successful rubbing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and our next photograph. Okay, the next photograph is actually the original grave site which is at Old St. Pancras Church in London. See the daffodils? Mm -hmm. uh, this is at least two weeks later, and uh, this is where originally she was buried along with Godwin and Godwin's second wife. But when the uh, tube station was dug, the, the tunnel was dug under the graves uh, yard, then her, would have been her grandson, had the bodies exhumed and moved to Bournemouth where he lived. Where we already shown that. Yes. And then so, we'll move on to the next okay. photograph on your journey. This is inside. Old St. Pancras Church. Now this was a high moment in my whole trip. This was when I got to go into the church where Mary Wollstonecraft was married to William Godwin and would have had her funeral service. And it's smoky looking in there because it was filled with delicious smelling incense on that Sunday when I got there. It's a very small church and wonderful friendly people who knew who Mary Wollstonecraft was. So much, uh, th several things her life uh, yes, evolved this around a, this, this church. Yes, this is a key place where yeah. she lived, yes, and worshipped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And our next slide. The next slide is the church itself, and this was as I came huffing and puffing up from the tube station, being lost as usual from Summerstown where she lived trying to find this church. By the way, there's a new St. Pancras church that I went to and was very excited about until I found the pamphlet that told me I was in the wrong church. But that was part of the adventure. <laughs> sure. And so I found this one and it had all these wooden pickets around. They were remodeling the churchyard and making a big beautiful park out of it. And we're a couple more close-ups of this, more, of yes, this of the same church. church. Mm -hmm. Here it is from the front, and the day I went there, first the door was closed, and then I came back and the door was open, and that's when I went to the service. And it's just so exciting to think so how many times went I went to a service there. That's when I was inside the church, I was attending a service there uh, on a Sunday. And the clock tower, and I had to take a picture of this clock tower. It doesn't come through very well, but there's one time on one clock and another on the other, so I don't think, I don't know what time it is would be an appropriate spot there. Uh, neither of those, by the way, was accurate with what time it was, but it's a very small parish. In fact, the, the minister had three churches that Sunday that he had to go serve in, and uh, I don't think they have time to fix the clock. And then we'll move on to on the journey. Okay, this is a sad sight. Um, this is the St. Pancras Bridge, the new one, and I'm looking across the bridge to where the old bridge would have been that burned down in the uh, 19th century. And about here, I would guess, is where Mary Wollstonecraft tried to commit suicide. She was deeply depressed having come back from Paris and discovered that her lover had been unfaithful, actually her second attempt, and she walked for half an hour in a heavy wool dress and then jumped into the Thames River right there. She was fortunately saved 
and finally decided she wanted nothing to do with Gilbert Imlay. Finally, she decided that. They're just another one of her examples. So much tragedy in her life. Yes, indeed. And then we shall move on. To yes, and this is uh, the Putney. I'm sorry, I think, did I say St. Pancras? I meant Putney Bridge. I think yes. I said St. Pancras. Okay. Glad we had this correction in there. Uh, this is the Putney Bridge Station. This is where I uh, came in the rain uh, to go to Putney Bridge. And I don't know if you could tell from the prior slide, but the sun actually did come out while I was standing on that bridge, looking down in that Again, you had that water. experience I had that experience, over. yes. Okay, and we go on now. Okay, this is a different church. Uh, I went from London by train up to Yorkshire and to a town called Beverly where Mary Wollstonecraft grew up when she, his, her father in one of his many moves moved here. And this is the York Minster, I'm sorry, this is the Beverly Minster. I did go to York as well. But this is the Beverly Minster where she would have worshipped and where they had just put in the organ, which I got to see the years that she lived there in 1768 and on until she was about 12 years old. And then we'll continue the this journey. Is, uh, this is looking at downtown, uh, beautiful downtown <laughs> Beverly. And the interesting thing is that these buildings would have been in existence when Mary Wollstonecraft was there. And this was Market Street. And this would have been where the market was when Mary Wollstonecraft lived there, particularly an old meat market that was uh, kind of a funky little place. There. So there are a lot of things that are still preserved. Yes, they yeah. are. Now, this is a big leap, and uh, after I, I went back to London, then I went to Scandinavia, and I only have a few slides of Scandinavia. I did go, actually, to um, Copenhagen, and then I went to uh, Sweden, Norway, and then back through uh, Norway, then Sweden, and back to Paris to fly home. But this is a really exciting place for me. This is Frederikstad, Norway. This is a place that is extant almost exactly as where she was there in, when she went to Scandinavia in 1795. And this, I think, is the old customs house that she would have had to have come through in Old Town when she came to that city. It's still there. It's still there, time. yes. And so are these other slides. Now, the next one coming up would have been the city gate. You see the date, 1776, mm -hmm. important to us. And this is one of the gates. It was a walled city. She writes in her letters about having to go in at night and be closed in because there are still a lot of wars going on there. Um, and I'm positive she would have walked through this gate. And you see there's a block down in the front. That's to keep modern vehicles, uh, cars, from going through there. Right. And we have a couple more from this visit. Here is the outside of the wall city. And you can see there's the water there on the right. Uh, they, of course, she traveled by boat. And this would have been the North Sea coming into uh, Norway there that she would have she would have been there. She might have stood right in that very place. And of course, it wouldn't have been the light post. But uh, this is going across the little ferry that I had to travel from the mainland where my hotel was across. and. Once again, I am excited to tell you the sun came out that day, and there it is. It was beautiful, and I uh, had pizza there, which was not exactly a Wordsworthy or um, a Wallstone Craftian dish, but <laughs> wonderful, friendly people in old Frederikstadt. You know, it, that's such a special thing for you to have the sun to come out, and uh, it gives you another mental picture of yes. and, and well-meaning. In fact, you told me that several times right. in our conversation. Uh, one of the little comments I'd make uh, about your trip is that that contrasts Europe with the United States. Uh, I was in Europe on tour with a group of students, and we went to a city, and they were celebrating their thousandth birthday. Yes. <laughs> I came home, and it just happened that summer that the city of Coeur d'Alene was celebrating its 100th birthday, which made it very hard to celebrate here. It didn't seem <laughs> nearly I as understand. significant. So yes. the, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that, that when you go to Europe and you're following the life of someone like Mary Wollstonecraft, you can get a lot closer to it because of the preservation yes. of so much of yes. the of the environment in the building. I agree. In, uh, in uh, the town of Larne, Wales, which I talked about last week, uh, that church was an 11th century church. Mm -hmm. And it's in really great shape. <laughs> people are still worshiping there. And so it really keeps people in touch with their it roots. It does, absolutely, yeah. yes. Janelle Burt. Last week we talked a bit about a theme vacation or a theme trip yes. uh, such as you were on. And this week I'd like to talk just a little bit about how you might prepare for a theme trip. It, does it require more preparation than for an ordinary trip? 
Oh, um, and what kinds of things do you do while you're there that are different from what you would do if you were just okay. regularly right. traveling? And then what do you do when you get home? So kind of before and during okay. and after. And, and last week we talked about what a good idea it was to do yes. that. But I know there'll be some people out there who will want to begin thinking about that. Well, I think uh, you could go about this in a couple of ways. I chose to do it on my own, again, because I was trying to have a verisimilitudinous trip with Mary Wollstonecraft who would have made all of her own arrangements. And I just swear by the internet because I went on the internet and that is where I continue to find remarkable things. Just today, for example, I found some more photos of Versailles that I wish I had taken those views. But I did find um, a lot of sites for plane tickets. I found sites for women traveling alone, which was really quite helpful to me. I bought a book called Gutsy Women that was about women who traveled alone. Um, I'm always into footnotes, but one of my favorites from on the, one of those on sites for women traveling alone is that some men get on there and want to know what, what women are like and what women really want are looking for in Paris. And these other women say, get off this site. This, we're not a mating service. We're trying to <laughs> travel. <laughs> so beware of some of those sites. But uh, to, to just trust yourself, to go ahead and punch okay send and that you're going to get a hotel reservation in Lisbon or wherever and I met some really interesting people getting bed and breakfasts on the internet by the way or you might otherwise just plan an itinerary through reading and that's of course what I did I had uh, read many books about Mary Wollstonecraft I knew where she was and as I planned my sabbatical I had this grand notion that I was going to go everywhere she went in the order she went well I could never have afforded that but to pick a route that you could travel and as I said I tried to go all the places where she had lived or traveled to and then I tried to figure out how long it would take me to get there and by what means I would go and I did have a little help from a travel agent with some of my Scandinavian journey but for the most part I planned all the rest of it but you could have a travel agent if you knew where you wanted to go and why you wanted to go there you can, of course, look up city sites and see if there are certain festivals. If you were going looking at plants, for example, I could do a daffodil trip. Um, I said I am going to do a trip for plants. I just became really interested in all the plants and picked little flowers on my way. And I would like, it would be interesting to do a botanical tour and see when the flowers might be in bloom that you were interested in. And then, as I say, get help from a travel agent if you didn't want to do that on your own. And while you're there, did you do a great deal of writing? Oh, did I ever. <laughs> May I show you my writing? Yes. I said Mary Wollstonecraft was an inveterate letter writer. This is most of the email that I sent and received while I was in Europe. I mean, that is a very, very thick book. It is a very thick yes. book. And it has little stickers of things that... Uh, this is one I chose that when I was in Norway that the women there were called Downy. The women who were a little overweight were called Downy. And I said, I like that name for... Little women who are a little and I plump side. You don't even have all of them in there. No, I don't have all of them in here. But what I would do is to say, plan on finding internet cafes wherever you go, which I did. Some of them were huge, like the ones in London are like big warehouses filled with them. And then the one I found in Lisbon, that was the one that was finally open. And you have to roll with the punches because it, there were supposed to be four of them, and I finally found one at 12 o'clock at night and there were only four there and and beware that the keyboard might not be all in English and I had quite the interesting accent in some places because the keys were what I was used to but I have a favorite quotation from Mary Wollstonecraft that sort of applies here when you run into things that aren't like home and this is Mary Wollstonecraft writing about her journey in Scandinavia and she says travelers who require that every nation should resemble their native country had better stay at home and so don't go if you want everything to be like home. And the internet cafes are often not like that, but they gave me instant access and connections to my family. And they're a wonderful record now, rather than carrying a heavy journal, because travel light is my motto. Only carry on, period, a carry on. And I pitched clothes, but I did, uh, did have my email that I could print when I got home. Something else you did, and I was eternally grateful you sent a lot of postcards oh, to yes, people. I, and I was <laughs> fortunate to be on that list and so you were so kind that you would write on the card where you were and, and I being in political science you would make some uh, contact with that like the Magna Carta and so forth and so and, and you have that too as, yes, I do. as part of your trip and, and it just 
it was such a nice way to share with us that uh, we felt like we were with you at certain points when we heard from you. And so I want to thank you for that. Uh, how has this in any way expanded or even changed your understanding of Mary Wollstonecraft, this journey? I think Janelle hit on one of the things at the beginning, and that is what a courageous person she was. I am I'm just still, after almost a year now that I, I left for this journey, actually I left in March of last year, just I'm, I'm beside myself with awe because I cannot imagine traveling under the conditions. As When she went to Scandinavia, for example, for this business trip, she had a year old baby with her and a, and a French nursemaid, and she had to leave them um, in Gothenburg, Sweden, while she went off on her own, not able to speak the languages, not really knowing any people. She had letters of introduction. She taught herself French, but off she went. And I was almost terrified, and I was lucky. Almost everyone I ran into spoke English, and they were very kind to me. Um, but and I had all the modern conveniences. And I could correspond immediately with my husband or with friends and say, help, or guess what, I got 180 degrees turned around and was lost for three hours, or walk up to total strangers. And she didn't have that luxury. So I think her courage, I think her vision that she could see the humanity in everyone whom she met, despite their differences, maybe in income and desires and religious beliefs that she was endlessly curious. What wasn't she well. also, you, you've taught me this, she also was visionary in the sense that she looked for a better world. Yes. Like the French Revolution. Yes. That, that yes. She could see there, there's another way to, right. to help all humanity. She was, she was a, a child of the Romantic era, era mm -hmm. in that way that she did say that the, her favorite topic of contemplation was making life better in this world. That when she had time to think, and I think she must have had plenty, that that was what she thought most about, is how to make it a better world. The final point on her in that light is that she died at a young age, you know, in childbirth. Yes. So she didn't get to live a long life, and yet, look at the, the amount of uh, publications that she died. I call it voluminous yes. works, particularly on women's um, rights, and uh, all those different types of writing she did, and to travel all she did, to put a full life in a, sh in a, a, in a abbreviated life, she must have had a tremendous IQ. Yes. Uh, when and to teach herself. Yes. Uh, in fact, you mentioned early on that she'd been sort of lost to history, and that has been as a result of the f one of the reasons is that her husband, William Godwin, decided shortly after she died to write her biography, and he included all the details. And to the point you just made, he says that she's a genius, that she was just brilliant. And I concur in what I've read about her and by her and so forth. But what he also did was to tell everything about her. He told about her love affair with Emily, the illegitimate child, the fact that she was in fact pregnant when she and before she and Godwin got married. They both were total independent believers that marriage wasn't for anyone and then they determined that they probably wanted to give legitimacy to what they thought was little William who turned out to be little Mary. So she was or five months pregnant when they got married. And he told all of this. Well, people were horrified. They called her uh, hyena and uh, really terrible names. And in one review of her life, they had in the index under Mary Wollstonecraft, see prostitution. You know, they just maligned her terribly. And so that kind of really incorrect image of her life followed her. And it was in the, n really not until about the 1950s and 60s in the U.S. that she became more well-known. In fact, in the last year, two new biographies of her life have come out. I want to change the subject to you a little bit. Um, I know you so well, and you've, you've given tremendous service to this institution for uh, somewhat over 30 years, I believe about 35, and you've mm -hmm. chaired the Division of English, <laughs> and now then this very large division, and you've taught for years, and your students rave about your techniques. But you told me after taking this trip, although you've done all those things, and you've written a lot yourself, uh, that it, it had impacted you and changed you personally. I hear that from other Chautauqua mm -hmm. performers, but in, in a different way because you, by your traveling. Would you share with our viewers how this has really given you another dimension in your own life? I'm going to quote Mary Wollstonecraft badly, so I know she'll forgive me, but she felt that travel was the completion of a liberal education. And I have a liberal education. In fact, Janelle and I both went to the same undergraduate college together. Yes. At, now it's Albertson College of Idaho. 
Um, and I feel that that's really true, that I really understand more about the importance of history. I was seven hours in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, for example, just staring at paintings, just seeing the real thing, just weeping at some of the beauty. I mean, and I've been to Greece and Turkey and so forth, but to see the in the Louvre, for example, the real thing, and to see the size of it, and to know why these are masterpieces, and that if I could, I would take all my students along with me, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure they'd all be ready for it. I think you have to be ready to see these things, and I don't, I mean, pearls before swine comes to mind. That I'm sure had I been going there when I was 19, I would have gone, where's McDonald's, you know, let's get on with this. But at a certain time when you have the background, it's like the theme trip, that to know something and then to go to see it makes it part of you. You know, it's part of your heart, it's part of your spirit, and that I think it gives you uh, legitimacy as a teacher, for one thing, that you live up to North Idaho College's mission, which is lifelong learning, and I'm here to be the poster girl for that one, I guess, to say, uh, you know, learning is living as far as I'm concerned, and traveling is just an extraordinary way to do that. And it, again, it's humanizing, you know, that you see that even if someone can't speak English very well, that person's a human being and may do something kind. And I told both of my sons who were in on these acts of kindness that pay it forward applies to them. If they see someone lost, go say, may I help you, may I take you to the place you need to go. Thank you. On that note, Dr. Johnson, we must bring the program to conclusion on behalf of Janelle Burke and our staff. It's been an absolute delight having you here these two weeks, and you're a beautiful example as you better understand and do your work before you go. You could never take this trip if you hadn't read all about Mary Wollstonecraft right. first. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed this program as much as we've enjoyed bringing you actually a two-week series on the life of Mary Wollstonecraft, an extraordinary uh, personality in history, uh, but, uh, actually brought to us by Dr. Virginia Tinsley Johnson, Chair of the Communications, Fine Arts, and Humanities North Idaho College. Uh, we've had a great time bringing the program to you. I hope you'll join us again next week at this same time when we'll move to yet another issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running entirely college produced program on PBS. Each episode is pre recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us again at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station.